Welcome to Lesson 7b, Complex Variables for Irritational Flow. In this lesson, we'll briefly review complex variables. I'll show you how to differentiate complex functions. Then we'll define the complex potential and the complex velocity for 2D irritational flows. We'll also introduce the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, harmonic conjugates, and the concept of mutual orthogonality. First, a quick review. These are the four solution techniques that I had discussed for incompressible irritational flow. The straightforward approach, the inverse approach, superposition using real variables, and now in this lesson, solutions using complex variables. We restrict our discussion to 2D incompressible irrotational flows. In some previous lessons, we were able to write u as del phi del x, where phi is the velocity potential, or del psi del y, where psi is the stream function, and similarly for v, v equal del phi del y, or negative del psi del x. This part we call the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, which show that phi and psi are related to each other. For these kinds of flows, we know that the Laplace equation applies for both phi and psi, and derivatives with respect to x and y are related by these Cauchy-Riemann conditions. It also turns out that lines of constant psi, streamlines, and lines of constant phi, which we'll call equipotential lines, equa meaning equal, are mutually orthogonal, which means that they cross each other at right angles or 90 degrees. There are exceptions, such as stagnation points and singular points. By the way, when we say lines, we really mean curves, but we don't say stream curves or equipotential curves. I'll always use blue for my streamlines, so this might be psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3, and I'll use dashed red lines for the equipotential lines, phi 1, phi 2, and phi 3. Mutual orthogonality means that everywhere that these intersect is a 90 degree right angle. In real variables, as I mentioned before, we can work with either phi or psi and get the same flow field. In complex variables, we combine phi and psi and solve them together. First, I'll give a very brief review of complex variables. We define complex variable z as x plus i y, or in cylindrical coordinates, r e to the i theta. i itself is the square root of negative 1, the imaginary unity number. We usually represent z on an xy plane with some value of x and some value of y, but y is the coordinate corresponding to the imaginary part. R is the magnitude of z, which from simple geometry is the square root of x squared plus y squared, and theta is this angle given by the arctangent. Let's define some other operations and rules. Complex conjugate of z is obtained by changing the sign of the imaginary part, and we use an asterisk. So the complex conjugate of x plus i y is x minus i y, and the complex conjugate of r e to the i theta is r e to the negative i theta. The magnitude is also called the modulus, and you could find it by taking the square root of z times z star, which gives the same magnitude r as we mentioned previously. Here are some other miscellaneous equations. We can split e to the i theta into cosine and sine components, and similarly for e to the negative i theta, cosine theta is given by this equation and sine theta by this equation. When you multiply two complex variables expressed like these, we get r1, r2, and since i appears in both of these exponents, e to the i, theta1 plus theta2. There's a trick for taking a function like this with a complex denominator and separating the real and imaginary parts. The trick is to multiply the denominator by its complex conjugate and do the same with the numerator, and then after some algebra, you can separate the parts with i and the parts without i the real part and the imaginary part. So this equation could be written as the real part plus the imaginary part, which in this case is negative. And this expression is sometimes more convenient to use, especially when you need to separate the real and imaginary parts. We will also have to take derivatives of complex functions. Doing so is relatively simple because we use product rules and exponent rules, etc., just like with real functions. We must define an analytic function. f of z is analytic if you can define a unique derivative within some region. 
It also turns out that if f of z is an analytic function, df dz is independent of the orientation of dz in the xy plane. Here are some example derivatives. If f is z squared, df dz is 2z, just like with real variables. Similarly, natural log of z has a derivative 1 over z. If we have something like log of z over z, we can use the product rule, just like we do with real variables. Now let's apply complex variables to 2D incompressible irrotational flow. First we define the complex potential function, or simply the complex potential. We'll use w, which is a function of z, defined as phi, which is a function of x and y, plus i times psi, which is also a function of x and y. Notice how we've combined phi and psi into one function, which is a function of z, which in turn is a function of x and y. I emphasize that w is complex, but both phi and psi are real. Now let's consider the derivative dw dz. But as I mentioned, the direction of approach of delta z when taking a derivative does not matter. For example, let's let delta z equal delta x. In our xy plane, some small increment delta z is horizontal in the x direction. In other words, we move horizontally to find the derivative. By definition of derivative, dw dz is the limit as delta z goes to 0 of w of z plus delta z minus w of z over delta z. But here we're letting delta z be delta x. So we can also write the limit as delta x goes to 0 of w of z plus delta x minus w of z over delta x. But this is the fundamental definition of del w del x. So dw dz is equal to del w del x. We get the derivative by approaching the derivative in the horizontal direction. Similarly, if we let delta z equal i delta y, we approach the derivative in the vertical direction. After some algebra, which I'll leave up to the student, we can show that dw dz is equal to minus i del w del y. Both of these equations must hold, so del w del x must equal negative i del w del y. Sir, I'm a little confused. It seems that taking these complex derivatives is making things more, uh, well, complex. Yes, it's a little confusing, but that's where the Cauchy-Riemann conditions come in. We define the complex potential as w of z is phi of xy plus i psi of xy. So taking the derivative, dw dz, as we just showed, is del w del x, which would be del phi del x plus i del psi del x, or dw dz is minus i del w del y, which again from our expression for w is minus i del phi del y minus i times i del psi del y. Well, we know, of course, that i times i is negative 1, and these two negatives cancel. So rearranging, this is del psi del y minus i del phi del y. But since the left-hand sides are the same, the right-hand sides must also be the same. And noticing that the real and imaginary parts are already separated, we can see that del phi del x must equal del psi del y, and del phi del y must equal negative del psi del x. These conditions are called the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, as I've already mentioned. You may also recall that this is u and this is v, which again shows how psi and phi are related to each other. In fact, psi and phi are called harmonic conjugates of each other. They are related through the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, and this confirms what we said about approaching the derivative from any direction. Let's define, then, the complex velocity which is simply dw dz, which turns out to be u from up here, minus i times v from up here. This is the complex velocity, which is simply the derivative of the complex potential. I note again that w is complex, but both u and v are real. Now consider the magnitude and direction of the complex velocity in our xy, or what we'll call the z-plane. Suppose we're at some point z, that has a velocity u vector with components u and v with magnitude capital V. And since these are right angles, the magnitude of velocity is the square root of u squared plus v squared. 
and we'll define this angle with respect to the x-axis as alpha, the angle of velocity with respect to the horizontal. It turns out that alpha is simply the arctangent of v over u. Our complex velocity dw dz is u minus iv, or in terms of capital V and alpha, we can also express the complex velocity as its magnitude times e to the minus i alpha. These two are equivalent, and we'll use whichever one is most convenient in our analysis. Finally, let's discuss the complex velocity and cylindrical coordinates, r theta and u r u theta. Again, in our z-plane, if we have some location expressed as r and theta with velocity u vector, we now want components u r the radial component and u theta the tangential component. We need to do a little trig to convert from u v to u r and u theta. Recall this angle is called alpha and this angle is called theta, the same as here. We can write u equal u r cosine theta, this part here, minus u theta sine theta, this little part here, and similarly v equal u r sine theta plus u theta cosine theta. Then the complex velocity u minus i v can be written out from these two expressions. A little trick here is to write this as i i u theta sine theta. Collecting all the terms with u r, we have cosine theta from here minus i sine theta from here, and then the terms with a minus i u theta, namely cosine theta from here, and one of these i's minus i sine theta from here. But cosine theta minus i sine theta is e to the minus i theta, and we see the same term here. Thus, the complex velocity is either u minus i v or u r minus i u theta, e to the minus i theta. Again, we'll work with either Cartesian coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, and sometimes both, depending on the problem at hand. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.